Going. All right. Hey, you guys can have a seat. We've got a special treat for us all uh, this morning. We're celebrating baptism here at Calvary today. And uh, baptism is an ordinance of the church. It's a time where people step forward and say that I have made uh, a decision to follow Jesus. I'm giving him my life. Um, I am, uh, the old me is dying and being buried. And the new me is being resurrected with Christ. And so we celebrate that today. And I want to invite my friend Thomas Hartley down here with me. So you guys welcome Mr. Thomas as he comes down. Thomas, uh, he was uh, over the last several months through Calvary Kids. You come on forward, run, sit right here. Uh, through the last several months, uh, through Calvary Kids and through talking with his family, who I invite forward right now, if you're a teacher or a family member of Thomas, uh, he's just been asking questions about what it means to follow Jesus. And uh, with his mom and dad, uh, the, he has uh, explained to them that he is ready to follow Jesus. And so uh, we are so proud and excited for him. And so, Thomas, I got two questions for you, buddy. Do you believe that Jesus Christ has done everything necessary to save you? Yes. And will you go wherever he calls you to go and do whatever he calls you to do? Yes. All right, buddy. Well, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Great job. Great job. Yeah. And I want to invite you, if you would, if you would stand and extend your arms out as we pray uh, for Thomas. Uh, God, we thank you so much for this decision that Thomas has made to follow you uh, and then to take the next step of obedience to be baptized. And so God, today we pray that he will never forget this moment. Time after time in your word, you command us to remember our baptism. And so God, I pray that he would remember this day Remember this commitment he's made to follow you on the days where he's tempted to doubt, on the days where he's tempted uh, to turn from you, Lord. Uh, I pray, God, that you would give him, you would call to his mind uh, his baptism, God, and that he would remember um, the life you've given him and the joy you've given him. And we pray all these things in your name. Amen. Great job, buddy. So grateful for, for Thomas. Baptism is such a beautiful thing. <clears throat> I'm going to call um, Charlotte Gosling to come on out. <laughs> and Charlotte's family can come up as well. Um, and friends of Charlotte can come around as well. Let's give it up for Charlotte as well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, Charlotte is is a 10th grader here and a member of our youth group, and Charlotte is just on fire for the Lord and for for Christ and and who he is, and it's it's so evident by so many who know Charlotte what Christ is doing in and and through her, and uh, she's made a profession of faith as well, and she wants to follow the Lord, and she wants to take this next step of obedience and baptism, and so Charlotte, I have two questions for you as well. Um, do you believe that Christ Jesus has done everything necessary for your salvation? And are you willing to go wherever he calls you to go and do whatever he calls you to do? Yeah. Amen. Well, based upon that profession of faith, I baptize Charlotte in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And I'm all, we're also going to have a time of prayer for Charlotte. So if everyone can extend their hands, we'll pray for her. Um, Father, thank you so much for the gift that Charlotte is. God, thank you for her parents. Thank you for her siblings. God, thank you for just the way that you're working so powerfully and so beautifully in her life. And 
Christ, we pray that Charlotte will remember this baptism, remember that she's been buried with Christ and raised to walk in the newness of the life that he provides through her, Lord, by his indwelling spirit. And so, Christ, we all just give you glory and praise and honor for what you're doing in Charlotte's life. And as Pastor Will mentioned, I, I pray that, you know, if she sees the days when it's hard, she'll remember the power of Christ in her. And so, Jesus, we love you so much, and we give all praise and honor to you. These things we all pray together as a family. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you. Play ball. Those were Greg Bartley's two favorite words. Growing up in Virginia, he was an accomplished high school and college uh, baseball pitcher, and he was drafted by the Seattle Mariners. And after a couple years of successful minor league ball, he was playing in a winter league in Caracas, Venezuela. And in spite of uh, living out his lifelong dream of playing professional baseball, he really had an uneasiness and, and just a lack of peace in his heart. And one evening in his motel room there in Caracas, he was... He was trying to sort some things out and he saw a Gideon Bible placed on the, the head of the bed there uh, where he was at. And he picked it up and started reading. And his mind went back to a college roommate uh, that he had. Donnell Nixon was a, another player that had on the back of his glove Colossians 3.23. So he looked through it and he found that verse and it reads, whatever you do, work heartily for the Lord and not for men. And right then in that hotel room, Greg knew what was wrong in his life. He was doing it for himself and rather for God. And he committed himself to following Jesus Christ. Who are the Gideons like the one that placed a Bible in that hotel room where Gideons are born again, uh, professional men, and uh, along with their wives and the Gideons auxiliary believe that distributing Bibles, uh, they distribute Bibles with the desire to see men, women, boys, and girls come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Isaiah 55, 11 says, so is my word that goes out of my mouth. It will not return to me void, but will accomplish what I desire and will achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Currently, there are about a quarter million Gideons worldwide. They distribute Bibles uh, in 100, over 100 different languages in 200 co uh, countries. And since that first Bible was placed in a motel room in Superior, Montana, Superior Motel, in 1908, Gideons have placed 2.5 billion, that's with a B, uh, Bibles. And that equates to, if you average it out, about 100 per minute every day of the, uh, of the year. Well, Layman Garrison began his journey to Christ with a 60-foot fall when the scaffolding he was working on at a construction site collapsed, and he was fortunate. He had a broken back and a couple, bro uh, a couple breaks in his leg, but the two co-workers that were working with him, they were actually killed in the accident. And Layman wanted to reach out to God, and, but he had made so many promises in his life before to God that he just, did, he just felt guilty about that. And one night he was in pain and his wife picked up a Bible there that had been placed in the hotel, uh, hotel in the hospital room and she started reading. And Layman said when she got to the last verse of John 16, it was as though God himself was speaking directly into Layman's life. And it says, I have said these things to you that in me, you may have peace in this world. In this world, you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. And Laman wanted that peace. And so he, he got, whether he lived or died. Well, he lived and he later became a pastor of a local church. He became, uh, did a lot of revivals and uh, untold number of people uh, accepted Christ as a result of a journey that started with his wife reading from a Gideon Bible in a hospital room. Well, how can you help? The first thing I would do is ask you to pray. Pray that doors will remain open so that we can continue to spread God's word, distribute God's word. Pray for funds because it takes uh, funds to print Bibles and, and ship them uh, around the world. Uh, I already mentioned about uh, giving. So giving uh, each one of these testaments, like the one I'm holding in my hand here, cost about $1.25 in order to print it and to ship it around the world. But you know what? It's not just around the world. Last month, October the 9th, Gideon's right here in Tuscaloosa placed 5,672 Bibles of God's word right across the street on the University of Alabama campus. 
Garrick Rudolph's journey to Christ began when a former, a, a previous UA distribution, a Gideon placed the Bible in his hand and prayed for him. And uh, Derek started reading that and he decided he would attend church. And the first time he attended church was on his 21st birthday when he walked through the back doors of Calvary Baptist. He later accepted Christ. And currently, if you read, he's living in Puerto Rico, but if you look, read his, his Instagram profile, it says, missionary anywhere, redeemed. So how can you give so that there are more Gregs and Laymans and Derricks? Well, for your convenience, after the service, we're going to have ushers at each of the exits. And so you can make a, a, a donation at that time. Uh, there's a brochure. There's multiple brochures uh, spread throughout the, uh, uh, the sanctuary. And there's a card there. If you don't have a check or cash and you want to do a debit credit card, there's a uh, slip in there that you can complete and make those uh, gifts to the Gideons. Robert Kozad from Pennsylvania became a Gideon because he enjoyed seeing men and women come to know, and boys and girls come to know Jesus Christ. And uh, back in uh, the mid eighties, he was helping with his church with a backyard Bible club. And he handed a young man a, 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 a Bible. His name was Marcus. And a couple weeks later, he decided to go back. He wanted to check in with Marcus. And he knew he would recognize him because Marcus had a birthmark right about his headline, uh, hairline. Now, Marcus's hairline, not mine. But when, when he got back, he couldn't find him. And he asked around, and the fam they said, well, Marcus's family has moved. Fast forward 25 years. Robert's doing what Robert does. He's going down to the church of volunteers a Thursday morning and he sees a man walking along the road and he stopped and he offered him a New Testament. And the man says, you know, I have one similar to that that somebody gave me a long time ago. And, but I just moved into town. I'm looking for a church home. Would, would you know where I could go? And he said, sure, I'm going down to my church now. They got in and as he traveled, the young man, or the man told his story and he said, you know, about 20 years ago, 25 years ago, a man handed me a Bible in my apartment complex. And that's when Robert looked closer and he saw the birthmark under the cap and he said, you're Marcus and I gave you that Bible. Well, your story and my story may not be like Robert's. This side of eternity, we may never know the impact that we make when we pray for Gideon to distribute in a hotel room or when you make a donation that places a Bible in a hospital room or at a school. But we do know this, and we can trust God's word. Isaiah 55, 11, so is my word that goes out of my mouth. It will not return to me void, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. So we pray, we give, and we distribute. Pastor Will, thank you for the, uh, wherever he, uh, there he is. Pastor Will, thank you for the opportunity to share about Gideon's International. Wow, well, I'm so grateful for uh, the ministry of the Gideons. I know they saved, uh, the Gideons saved me a couple of weeks ago, about a month ago. I was in, on, uh, my wife and I were going uh, on vacation to the Dominican Republic and I got to the airport, the Birmingham airport and realized I'd forgotten my Bible. And I said, you know what? We're good. There will be a Gideon's Bible in the hotel room, and there was. So saved my vacation. So um, as you guys are leaving today, please consider being generous uh, to the Gideons with the ushers on your way out. Um, I have an exciting announcement to make. Anybody up for good news? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, over the last year, we've been seeing God add to our church staff over the last several uh, months, we've had an executive pastor, a, a college pastor, a student pastor, and uh, just so excited about the team that God is building here at Calvary. And I'm here today to announce that um, myself, Dan, and our personnel committee are ready to present a kids pastor candidate uh, to Calvary. And so that's, everybody says, yes, excited, amen. How, yeah. Um, you, if you are part of our newsletter, you got uh, an email this week with his resume and details, but his name is Joey Rowland. Uh, Joey will be here on November 19th. He'll be here in view of a call. Uh, we will have a special call business meeting at both services where we will affirm him, Lord willing, as the next kids pastor here at Calvary. And I do want to just say a couple of things that his references have said about him. Uh, one of his references said, Joey 
is probably the most knowledgeable kids person I know. Another uh, reference said, Joey's primary strength lies in his ability to recruit and nurture teams. He excels in all tasks, enabling him to retain and develop volunteers for his ministry. Joey has a talent for building teams and significantly increasing volunteer support. He is the ideal candidate for growing and shepherding kids and a kid's ministry. He also said Joey is the funniest person he knows. So there's a plus. Um, So we are super excited about Joey Rowland being here in a couple of weeks. And so I want to encourage you to be here November 19th as our church makes this important decision. Well, if you have your Bibles... I invite you to turn to Exodus chapter 14. Um, This is, if you're familiar with the Exodus story, this is the the account of the Israelites crossing the Red Sea and into uh, into freedom. And Jim Gaffigan, if you know who Jim Gaffigan is, he's a comedian, he says, it's probably easier to land a quadruple jump in ice skating than to get my five children to depart our home in a timely manner. He said, I don't know how Moses did it, all right? So with that, let me pray for us. Uh, God, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you for all the incredible things happening here at Calvary. God, we thank you for the ministry of the Gideons. We thank you for Charlotte and for Thomas, um, who today we got to witness their profession of faith through baptism. Uh, God, we thank you for Joey and his family, his three kids and his wife. uh, And we're excited, Lord willing, for the future that he will have here at Calvary. And God, I pray that you would speak to us today through your word. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, you know, years ago, um, I had a a friend who lived in our apartment building. His name was Jimmy. Um, Jimmy was a good man. Uh, He became a good friend to my family and I. He was always out on the front stoop of our apartment building, and we got to know him real well. And like I say, he was a good man, but he was a man with a complicated, shall we say, past. Um, He had served 19 years in prison made some mistakes, some failures in his life. And um, one night, uh, Jimmy and I went out to dinner at our, uh, my favorite hot dog spot. Uh, if you're ever in Brooklyn, New York, 95th Street, get you a Lockyard hot dog. It's the best thing in the world. Um, but he and I were having, uh, eating our hot dogs, and I was just listening to him tell his story uh, of his life. And he was telling me about when he was released from prison. And I admit now, before I'd have a con- had a conversation with an ex-con, I had never considered how difficult it would be to leave prison. I just always thought it would be in a, you know, a great day. But I want you to imagine, from a, he talked about how difficult it was after being in jail for 19 years, how difficult it was to step into real life. And I want you for a moment to imagine what it must be like if, say, you've been a prisoner for 20 years, and then you get the news, you've been, had good behavior, somebody comes in and says, hey, congratulations, you've been paroled. You're free to leave the prison walls. And so you're excited. You've got joy. You're thrilled. You're, I mean, just all these, these incredibly positive emotions running through your mind. I mean, just freedom, you're thinking. As you collect your things and you walk out the gates, free at last, you think. And I mean, you think that'd be such an amazing moment, but have you ever thought about what the following days and weeks and months would be like? What do you do next? You've been in jail for 19 years. I mean, have you ever considered how difficult re-entry into normal life would be for an ex-con? I mean, for 20 years, you've been in prison, behind bars, in chains. Um, And yes, that's difficult. Nobody wants that. But you knew where your meals were coming from. And you knew there was a bed to sleep in at night. It's bondage. Prison is a form of bondage, but it's a predictable kind of bondage, isn't it? And then you're released into the real world. You have to provide for yourself. You have to live with the stigma of being uh, an ex-con. You have to find a place to live. They're always going to do a background check. You have to make a way for yourself in the world. You got to find a job. All that stuff is difficult to do when you have a record. And not to mention, can you imagine how much the world changes in 20 years? So you step out of prison and nothing is the same anymore. It's freedom. Yes, you're free. But living as a free person can be very difficult when all you know is bondage. That's why in Alabama, 30% of criminals will end up back in prison within three years of their release. And Alabama's got one of the lowest recidivism rates in, in America. See, freedom is hard for those who are familiar with slavery. 
Freedom is hard for those who are familiar with bondage. And that's what my friend Jimmy said was so difficult. He said, my whole life, he said, I'm trying to do right. I'm trying to live, walk the straight and narrow. He said, but it would be so much easier to return to the old way of life. And uh, being a Christian is like this, isn't it? I mean, we know we're free. We've been set free. We've been set free from sin and shame and guilt and fear. We've been set free from death. But we will spend the rest of our lives on a journey to fully experience this freedom. And there will always be temptations for us to go backwards, won't there? And the lesson from the Exodus story is this. It's that it's not enough to know with our heads that we've been set free from shame, guilt, and fear but rather we must be set free for something more. There has to be a greater purpose on the other side of bondage for us to keep us moving forward. There has to be something on the other side of slavery that we can give our lives to. This is why God says, let my people go so that they may worship me. Let my people go from a life of slavery so that they can live into the life that I've called them to live, a life of worship and freedom. And the people of Israel, they gained that freedom when God led them out of Egypt. But the rest of the Exodus story, and there's, we're not even halfway. There's plenty more to the story. We're going to see the Israelites trying to experience what freedom it really is. And it's going to be difficult for them at, at every, at every turn. And I don't think there's anything more practical than the Exodus story because we all struggle. We all struggle with what it means to be truly free. You know, we sing the song here at Calvary, I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. Well, is that true? Yes. But are you experiencing that truth? Do you feel that you are no longer a slave to fear? We know that through Christ, we've been set free from the chains of fear and shame and guilt. But yet every day we have to choose freedom rather than going back to the shame and the guilt and the fear. And we pick up our story today In Exodus 14, last week, we looked at the Passover where in this one decisive moment, God freed the people of Israel from slavery in Egypt. And they're free to go. They're free to leave. And so they gathered their things and they leave Egypt where they've been in bondage for 400 years. God appears in a literal pillar of fire and they begin to follow God out of slavery into freedom. And God himself was leading them. I mean, what could be more exciting than that? And chapter 14 picks up, it starts in verse one. And listen, we're gonna read a lot of Bible today. Some of you guys watched 12 hours of football yesterday, okay? You can handle three minutes of scripture reading, okay? Don't tune out, all right? Verse one says, then the Lord said to Moses, tell the people of Israel to turn back and encamp in front of Pihahirath between Migdal and the sea, in front of Baal Safan. You shall encamp facing it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the people of Israel, they're wandering in the land, the wilderness has shut them in and I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will pursue them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his host and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord and they did so. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, the mind of Pharaoh and his servants was changed towards the people and they said, what is this we have done that we have let Israel go from serving us? (laughs) So he made ready his chariot and took his army with him and took 600 chosen chariots and all the other chariots of Egypt with officers all over them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the people of Israel while the people of Israel were going out defiantly. The Egyptians then pursued them, all of Pharaoh's horses and chariots and his horsemen and his army, and overtook them and camped at the sea by Pihahirath in front of Baal Safan. And when Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, it's because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness. What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we might serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. Now, the first sermon point today is this. The journey to freedom is never a direct route. I want you to imagine for a moment that you're an Israelite. You're a slave in Egypt. You've been a slave your entire life. Generations of your family have been enslaved by the Egyptian people. And you've been praying for years and years and years for God to hear you. And then in a moment, God steps in. He sends a deliverer and you're freed. 
And, and, and the, the pathway for you to leave slavery is before you. And so you trust God and there's excitement and there's joy and there's confidence. And if you read the Exodus story, you see that the people of Israel, as they're leaving Egypt, they got so much confidence in the power of God to save them, so much swagger that they're like pillaging Egypt on the way out. They're like, God is on our side. Dare you to do something about it. I mean, they're just coming out with all this confidence. And they start following God. God literally appears to them in a pillar of fire. And they walk literally from their old life and they leave their chains behind into their new life. And they're just fired up, high-fiving each other, chest bumping. We got that. Yeah, we're free. And then they're following God. And then God takes a left when you know that the fastest route is to go right. God zigs when you're like, he should be zagging right now. And you're like, what is God doing? Why is he taking us the long way around? And then he leads you to the sea, the ocean, and you look ahead and all there is is nothing but water. And in the Hebrew mind, the sea represented chaos and danger. The ocean was impassable. What are you going to do? Walk through it? Are you going to swim through an ocean? You can't do that. And so here you are, you're going, if I continue to follow God, I'll, uh, I'll drown. I won't be able to make it. What am I going to do? And then you turn around and your slave masters are coming after you. The new life in front of you looks impossible and your old life is closing in behind you. What do you do? You're trapped. You feel like you can't move forward because there's this huge obstacle in front of you and you're stuck in the middle. And what do you do when you're stuck in the middle? What do you do when you're stuck between the freedom and the promises? Well, we know what the Israelites did. They turned to Moses And they said, what have you done, Moses? We told you that we wanted to stay in Egypt. They hadn't told him that. Selective memory. They're going, it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die here in the wilderness. And listen, if you want to understand yourself, if you want to understand your interior life, I want you to spend some time thinking about this part of the Exodus account. The people turned to Moses and I mean, Moses has been their deliverer. He's led them into freedom and they turned to him. The moment they face an obstacle, they turned to Moses. What have you done to us? They asked God, God, what have you done to us? What has God done for them? He set them free. He's delivered them. He's redeemed them with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. But the moment they become afraid, the moment they feel their circumstances closing in on them, they no longer wish to be free. And in the new life, they want to go right back to the old way. They were in slavery, yes. Yes, they were in danger. But now they want to go back. And they turn on Moses when their expectations aren't met. Yes, they know Egypt was a terrible place. It was slavery. But it was a familiar kind of slavery. And they would rather return to the prison they were familiar with than venture forward with God into an unknown future. I think of the movie Shawshank Redemption. Every guy in the room is like, Ugh, yeah, you know, Shawshank, top three men movies of all time. Gladiator, Braveheart, Shawshank. It's a Wonderful Life, best holiday movie for men, right? But there's, you know, Brooks in Shawshank Redemption. He had spent life in prison. He gets to go in his old age and he just couldn't live. He couldn't live free. He had been in prison his whole life, and he says, you know, these prison walls are funny. First you hate them, then you get used to them, and enough time passes, and it gets so that you depend on them. Egypt was a terrible place, yes, but it was familiar to the Israelites. And they they, they were stuck between freedom and slavery, and they didn't know what to do, and so their temptation was to, to drift back towards slavery. Years ago, I began to feel God's Spirit really convicting me about something in my life that I felt was enslaving me, and it was my work habits. I I know we live in a culture that celebrates people who work hard, and they celebrate workaholism and overworking and all that sort of stuff, and people are always like, you know, what's your greatest weakness? My greatest weakness is that I I work so hard, you know? Um, But the truth is... um, Work had become a real issue for me. I was pastoring a growing church in New York, and I was just working a lot. Um, I was neglecting my family. I was neglecting my health. Um, I was going into the office on my days off. When I was home, the laptop was always right nearby. 
I remember one time I was sitting, my daughter was in my lap and I was sitting there sending emails on my phone and she literally looked around the phone to make eye contact with me. And I said, something's got to change. And not only was I hurting my family, but it was making me anxious. I was anxious all the time. I felt like I was a slave to my job and to workaholism. I became unhealthy, gained a bunch of weight. I wasn't sleeping. I was depressed. And I remember just kind of laying this before my counselor one, time, one week. And he said, Will, when was the last time you were at rest? And all it took was that question. And I broke down and I just began sobbing because I literally could not tell him the last time that I was at rest. And I knew something had to change. And at that time I was reading the gospels and I see all these commands where Jesus is commanding us to rest. He's commanding us to take a Sabbath. He even promises blessing to those who honor the Sabbath. Abide in me, rest in me and you'll bear much fruit. And that was what I was trying to do anyway. I was trying to bear fruit by working my tail off. And Jesus is going, take a break. Rest in me and you'll bear much fruit. And so I made this kind of decisive moment where I said, I'm no longer a slave to work anymore. I'm going to work hard, yes, but I'm going to do it within uh, appropriate boundaries. And, you know, I'm a little type A, so I made the spreadsheet. I said, okay, this is what rest is going to look like for me, all right? Um, You know, I'm going to leave the office at 5 p.m. And when I leave the office, I'm leaving the office. I'm not popping the laptop open. I'm not answering emails. I'm not going to uh, dump all the church stuff with, on my wife when I get home. Uh, I'm going to turn do not disturb on my phone off. I'm going to take a day of rest each week, the Sabbath. I'm going to take time every day to rest and exercise. I'm going to start taking all my vacation days, something I had never done before. And I remember telling my church at the time, I said, look, if you want, you guys feel free to call me on Saturdays or after 7 p.m. You go right ahead, but I'm not going to answer because Jesus told me to rest. And if you don't like it, you can take it up with him. I was like, I'm going to rest. You know, I was excited. Sabbath, baby. I'm going to be free, free from the slave, the addiction to work. And then Friday came. Fridays are my off days, right? I work on Sundays. So Friday and Saturday is my weekend and Friday comes. My kids are at school, my wife's working, and I'm sitting there alone, and I've told myself, I'm not gonna check email, I'm not gonna look at my phone, and I'm sitting there going, I am so bored. But not only that, I wasn't doing anything, and I was going, if I'm not doing something, I feel insignificant. If I'm not producing something, or if I'm not accomplishing something, if I'm not getting something done, who am I? Who am I? I feel so insignificant. And I I started like wrestling with all this fear. Am I letting the church down by taking a day off? I'm having anxiety. I'm like, I bet my inbox is filled with voicemails and emails. And what's going on? Is there, is the, has the church burned down and I don't know about it? Like what's happening? And I'm all this anxiety and all this fear about this, this new commitment. And I felt, I'm like, God, you promised that if I rest in you, I'll find freedom. But boy, this, I, I, this is so scary. And that day I was so tempted to turn back around and go back to what was familiar. Yes, it was slavery behind me, but there was unpredictability ahead of me. And I was like, I don't know what to do. And I don't know what, what it is for you. What about you? What, what's, what have you ever left behind? An addiction, a relationship, a disorder, a destructive habit. You know those things aren't good for you. You know they're enslaving you, but when you leave them behind and you kind of start to make your way out of Egypt, then you come to a sea. And whatever that ocean is for you, it's an obstacle and you're like, this looks hard and this looks unpredictable and this looks scary and I don't know what's gonna happen if I step into these waters. And so what you want is to turn back around, go back to the familiarity of the old life, even if the old life was killing you. Now, the question is, is why did God take Israel on this route? Why did he lead them to the ocean? There was a direct route. He could have taken them into freedom. Why doesn't God take the direct route? Here's why. Because the purpose of Exodus was never merely for God to get the Israelites out of Egypt. It was to get Egypt out of the Israelites. Why doesn't God just snap his fingers and take our temptations and our addictions away? Because it is on our journey to freedom that God wants to teach us how to trust and depend on him every step of the way. You see, God could have teleported Israel straight out of the land of Canaan. 
But he took them the long way. Why? Because they still relied on Egypt. They still relied on their oppressor. And they needed to kill their dependence upon Pharaoh before they could fully depend on God. And the Israelites, as they're looking out at the ocean, they saw only two options, slavery or death. And they chose slavery, but Moses steps in and says, don't factor God out. Moses said to the people, verse 13, fear not, stand firm, see the salvation of the Lord, for he will work for you today. For the Egyptian whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you and you have only to be silent. The Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Lift up your staff, stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it that the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. 30, the, the next sermon point I want to give you is this. The journey of freedom requires that you keep going forward. Do you hear the commands in this passage? Uh, it, do not be afraid. Stand firm. See the salvation of the Lord. Go forward. Man, we need somebody to say that to us every day, don't we? Because we wake up and you know what the world tells us? Figure it out. Man up. But what happens when you can't figure it out? What happens when you come to the shore and all that's before you is ocean? There's an obstacle that's too big for you to take. What, what, what do you do? What, what encouragement is there? The Lord says, don't be afraid. Stand firm. See the salvation of the Lord. He comforts them, but then he gives them a command. He says, go forward. And you know, the Israelites are like, forward? It's the ocean. It's like Michael Scott when he's following the GPS off into the lake. You're like, you can't do it. They're like, forward? Listen, sometimes God calls us to go forward into things that make no sense to us. And in those moments, what we need is humility. Just because we can't see a way doesn't mean that God can't make a way. And sometimes we find ourselves in positions like Israel. We want to leave slavery behind. We want to leave the addictions behind. We want to leave uh, the, the life of shame behind. But freedom feels so dangerous and uncertain. And we feel stuck in the middle. And God speaks to us in those moments. He says, don't stay there. Keep walking. I know many of you, your faith, as you come in here today, you're here and your faith feels weak. Uh, you, you, you're, you're trying to follow Jesus. You're trying to leave the old life behind, but you're like, it just feels so hard, this obedience to Jesus. And you're tempted to just say, it's not working. <laughs> it was so much easier the other way. I know, I, was, I know it wasn't life. I wasn't living. But to follow Jesus sometimes feels like I'm dying. And the old way, it may not have worked either, but at least it felt familiar. And can I please tell you, and I say this with the authority of the scriptures behind me, thus saith the Lord, keep walking. Keep walking forward in obedience. David Mamet is a playwright, and he said he gave a commencement speech at University of Vermont. And he said on June 5th, 1944, there were thousands of American paratroopers who jumped into Normandy. But there were four men who refused to jump. Four men who stayed in the plane who said, I'm not gonna risk it all. I'm not gonna take that step of courage. And David Mamet said, can you imagine the rest of these men's lives? What prodigies of self-excuse, rationale, or repression they must have had to employ. Their lives, in effect, ended the day that they refused to leave that plane, as would the lives of the Jews had they refused to go into the sea as will yours and mine, and as they do in part, when we each refuse the opportunity to change. We stagnate and we perform even greater prodigies of repression and hypocrisy to explain to ourselves why we don't immerse ourselves in the mysteries of life. David Mamet says, we all die in the end, but there's no reason to die in the middle. And God is saying to Israel, don't you dare die right here. You just left. You are free, but you are not yet experiencing the fullness of your freedom. So keep walking in obedience. And I'm here to say to you today, church, keep walking in obedience to Jesus. Jesus said, pick up your cross and follow him. To live is Christ, but to die is gain. Jesus himself said, the road is narrow that leads to life. 
And Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount that there is a road that, 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 that is treacherous and dangerous and uncertain and scary, and we don't want to go on it because nobody else is on it and it's unfamiliar. But Jesus said that's the road that leads to life. He said there's another road that's wide, got nice manicured paths, and everybody's on it, but that leads to destruction. Don't stop here. Don't stop in the middle. Keep walking forward. And as the people of Israel do, God splits the sea. And he makes a way for them to walk into their freedom. And it says, in the scriptures, it says that the Egyptians pursued and they went after the Israelites. And as they came after the Israelites, God, Moses took down his staff and the waters fell on the enemies of the people of God. And it says, thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. And the final thing I want you to hear today is this. On the journey to freedom, the Lord will fight for you. As the Israelites stepped forward into the way that God had prepared for them, they saw his mighty hand and outstretched arm at work in their lives. Centuries of waiting, years of hoping, years of anguish, desiring that God would redeem them and set them free. And here they are now, they are living in that freedom, but they had to go forward through the sea. And when they stepped through the waters, the scary, unpredictable waters, when they took the step of obedience, God delivered and he split the seas so they could walk through them. And as they did, they saw the trustworthiness of who the Lord is. They saw that he was true to his word. They saw that he fought for them. And on the other side of the sea, on the other side of their obedience, they turned and they looked back at the ocean and they saw the waters closing in on the bodies of their oppressors and they were free. Do you believe that God can do this for you? Do you believe that all those things that hold you in bondage and those things that overwhelm you, addictions, disorders, relationships, destructive habits, temptations, fear and shame and guilt, do you believe that God can lead you through the waters of freedom and destroy the enemies that enslave you? This Exodus 14 closes with this verse. It says, Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. Israel saw the great power of God and they, would never, they never would have seen God's power if they had gone the easy route. They never would have seen God's power if they, could, they had taken the direct route. The dangerous and indirect route of freedom, that's where they saw God's glory on display. And it's right here where we see why God took them the long way around. He took them the long way around so that he could show them his power so that they would fear the Lord. Remember, they feared Pharaoh more than they feared God. But when they saw God do this mighty work, their, their fear was no longer toward Pharaoh, but it was toward God himself. And they believed in his promises. You know, we sing a song here at Calvary. It says, you split the sea so I could walk right through it. My fears, my addictions, my shame is drowned in perfect love. Are you experiencing that today? And you may ask, how do I experience this freedom? How, I, I, this freedom that the Israelites experienced, how do I experience it? Well, the New Testament authors continually tell us that the Exodus account, as beautiful and inspiring, as powerful as it is, is merely a shadow of a greater Exodus. In the Exodus, God took a situation that spelled nothing but doom for his people, and he turned it into the very means with which he saved them. Now, where else, let me ask, does God do this? Where else does God take the object of defeat, the very thing that the powers of darkness thought was their means of victory and turn it into the salvation of his people? Hundreds of years later, God did the same thing in Jerusalem, outside of Jerusalem. What looked like certain defeat, God used as an instrument of his victory. On the cross of Christ, God used death to defeat death and to defeat the one who held the power over death. At, at the Exodus account, God displayed his power over Pharaoh, but on the cross of Christ, God displayed his power over Caesar and Pontius Pilate, and not only them, but on the cross of Christ, God displayed his power over all the things that demand our attention and our devotion, all the things that try to suck the life from us, things like our addictions and disorders and temptations, all the structures and the powers and the principalities of this world that enslave us and overwhelm us and overpower us, all these things have been put in their subordinate place under the stomping foot of Christ who stomps the head of the serpent and nails our sin and our shame to his cross. 
Jesus passed through the waters of death on the cross and he drew sin and shame and guilt and fear and death into the waters with him. But he came out on the other side alive at the resurrection and the dead bodies of our sin, guilt, shame and sickness have been strewn along the shore as Jesus stands in victory. And the cross of Christ shows us once and for all that God wins and he will win. And so the command for us today, and this is a command, it's this, don't be afraid, stand firm, see the salvation of the Lord, go forward. We are God's people, church, and we need not fear. We can step forward in faith and obedience, and that's going to look different for each of us, but you can step forward in faith and obedience knowing that the Lord will fight for you. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I know some of you know the words. You split the sea so I could walk right through it. My fears are drowned in perfect love. You rescued me so I can stand and sing. I am a child. Of God. Church, would you stand? We're going to sing a song of response. And I don't want you to forget that God's command to Pharaoh was this, let my people go so that they may worship me. And some of you, you are slaves to bondage. You're, you're enslaved to your sin. You're enslaved to your fears. You're enslaved to your anxieties and your circumstances. And the cross of Christ promises you freedom. But the freedom is not just that the chains would fall off, but that you would live a life of worship to the God who saves you. And we experience the most freedom when we are walking in obedience to Jesus. The Westminster Confession of Faith says the chief end of man, the purpose for your life. And I know there's college students here. You're like, what is God's will for my life? Is it this major? Is it to marry this person? Is it to move to this city? Here's the will of God for your life. To glorify God and enjoy him forever. And so I want us to call us into a time of response. And if you're here and you just need to come to this altar and you just need to stretch out your chains and let God break them, you come forward and do that. If you're here and you need to walk in obedience, if there is an ocean in front of you that you are afraid to step into, would you come here and confess that you trust and believe that God will provide for you, that he will fight for you every step of the way. So you come as we sing, you respond however the spirit leads as we sing.